So we're going to transition. You know, Kylie's always going to be in tears with me. Always. <laughs> you don't know me. You're going to be in tears. But I want to introduce Kylie Stores. Kylie is like, if you don't know Deborah in the Bible, this is who I think of like Kylie. Kylie is, um, and I'm not just saying flattery words, this is true. She's a powerhouse woman of the Lord. She has inspired me personally and has helped me step into my calling in ways you don't even even know because I've watched you just do it. Kylie is um, she is on um, staff with Grip, but she's also a nurse and has a whole organization in Pittsburgh that ministers to um, black nurses. So she does a, a ball there each year. She's also on 20s, 30s. She's one of our deacons. She just does so much. So much. She's also an author. She's written two books. Um, but out of all of that, she's a woman who's desperate for the Lord and loves God. And I'm just excited that she's a part of our women's ministry team and that you're going to hear from her today. So I'm going to pray for Kylie and then I'm going to welcome her up. And Lord, we just thank you for Kylie. We thank you that you have been her firm foundation, the rock on which she can stand. And I thank you about what you brought her through and how she's able to stand and minister and give back to you um, an offering of praise and a testimony. I pray that your power would just flow through her. She's already a powerhouse because you've given it to her, but I'm just praying that you would just move today. Lord, I pray, I'm excited about what you have for me personally through Kylie. Help us be excited. Help our souls be thirsty for what you're going to do today through Kylie. Lord, prepare us and prepare her, God. And we thank you for her. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, Kylie. All righty. Um, so as you guys can see, the title, um, we're, in, we're in the series, Into the Light, but um, I want to specifically talk about um, sorrow and trust in spite of. And so um, as I share my story and we talk a little bit about um, the story of Hannah, I just want us to be very honest. So I said, hmm. <laughs> I just want us to be honest about where we are with God. Um, you guys may be in a bad space, or you actually may be in a good space. I learned to start saying that because sometimes we go to events or whatever, and it's like, if you're in a bad space, but sometimes it's a good season for you. So if it's a good season, like, praise God, that's awesome. Um, but no matter what season you're in, I guess what you just, I want you guys to make an honest assessment of where you are. Um, and not for anybody else to know your business or to be criticized or anything like that, but I want us to look at our stories, bringing it all into the light because God is going to meet us where we are. And so I'm going to pray again. We love prayer, Chicago West. And um, yeah, I just think it's important. So God, thank you for this time. I pray that um, I can share my story well, but also we can just look on the story of Hannah and see how um, we can just be desperate to cry out to you in this season um, and bring whatever it is that we need to bring to the light, Lord. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So I briefly want to talk about my personal story and where I came from and where I am specifically now, um, specifically in the spaces of sorrow and suffering. If I cry, just, just bear with me. Um, so I was born April 4th, 1991, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I was born on a bathroom floor, you guys. Um, my mother and father had me, um, but before I was born, they decided that they were going to give me up for adoption. And so um, my, brother, my father is from Nigeria. He came to Pittsburgh to um, go to school to be an engineer. And my mother, she was just hanging out on, on a university campus and um, kind of met my, met my father at that point. And she already had a daughter, so I have an older sister, and they got together and they were in a relationship. But um, pregnancy obviously was not in the, in the cards. And so once she found out she was pregnant, she kept it to herself. I was in secret. She did not take any prenatals. She did not go to the doctor. Like it was, she just hid her pregnancy from everyone. 
And so um, her and my father decided that they wanted to um, give me up for adoption. So uh, I look back on that, I think like even before I was born, I feel like I carried a spirit or a seed of not being wanted. And so um, my mother had me spontaneous birth. She had me in the house because nobody knew she was pregnant except my father. And um, she, they whisked me away to the hospital. Um, praise God. I, I thank God. And this is why I want to talk about this wrestle between our sorrow, but also trusting and loving God. Because my mom could have done anything. She could have put me, you know, in the trash. She could have flushed me down into my placenta was literally in the toilet. And I'll get to how I know all of this in a second. But um, <laughs> I know it's, it's crazy. And here's the thing, you guys. My story is so wild. So it, it feels like I'm all over the place. Just talk to you after. <laughs> but um, my placenta was in the toilet. So she could have done so many things, but she didn't. And I praise God for that. So I went on to the hospital. And um, I was immediately placed in foster care to um, a white family. Their last name were the, the Lechenfields. So um, the Lechenfields took care of me for 18 months. Um, and I, it was it was awesome. I'm, and uh, the reason why I know it was awesome is because I had like they had a beautiful book for me, a picture book, and they used to um, typewriter. They used a typewriter, and they used to write notes like of all the things that I love and all the things that I I did in my milestone. So I knew at that time I was um, taken care of. But over the years, all of this has created a deep desire for family and just genuine love and affection. And so, um, in the midst of that, I, I got adopted. I was adopted to um, my adopted mother. Her name is Gwen. Um, and so, and it was rare because she was a single mother. And at that time, single mothers, like it wasn't, it was rare for them to be able to adopt. Usually, they would want you to be in a two parent household. Um, but she adopted me, and um, she always like kept me in church. And so, I had an understanding of God at a very young age. I remember like five years old asking questions like, if God, you're real, then who made you? Like, I was asking, that's why I love apologetics. <laughs> I just think that it was just steeped in me, like, very young. And so, um, my mother kept me in church, but um, over time, things began to shift because over the course of some years, she, my adopted mother, had um, three strokes and breast cancer. And so, I went from not being with my biological parents because, like, they didn't want me. But then I finally was wanted by my mother, but she couldn't physically take care of me because she was sick. And so you can imagine the type of um, just lack of like love and care and affection that um, I have felt over those years. Um, because she was sick, I was her primary caregiver for a lot of years and I essentially raised myself. So I would probably say I was on my own raising myself since I was probably like 13. And um, it, was, it wasn't easy. My mother was in and out of the hospital um, my entire like, middle school, high school years. And I leaned on, I was in and out of friends' homes because I couldn't be at home by myself. I was still young. And so I went to the homes of my friends. And even at the time, in terms of like financially, I would lean on, just being honest, like boyfriends because I didn't have money and the finances to be able to um, take care of myself until everything got straightened out, straightened out with my mother. And again, I always look back on those moments because I could have done anything. Like I could have been in the streets being crazy. I was just trying to survive. And so I thank God that in, in the midst of that, I still like had an understanding of who God is. And um, I thank God that, you know, despite all of that, um, he continued to care for me and show to me in ways I couldn't even imagine because being on your own so young, you could get into literally anything. And um, I was, I was for the most part, okay, but still emotionally feeling that lack of love. Um, I went to, during high school, um, I found the love of nursing. And I think part of it was because of what my um, biological mother was going through, but I just like nursing. And so <laughs> I knew right after high school, I wanted to um, go to school, go to college to be a nurse. And then right before going to college, I ended up getting uh, baptized and saved for real for real. So, You know, we got our stories like in summer camp, I think that was my first, at like eight years old, I think that was my first encounter with God. But for me to really make that decision myself, I would say was right before I went to college and after high school. And so 
I went to school, graduated, went back to school, and at that time, my faith began to deepen. And you know, as us as believers, as you start to grow, you start to hear these words like forgiveness. And so I'm like, man, they keep talking about this forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. And it clicked to me like, man, I need to forgive my biological mother and father because at this time, I still have not, I didn't know them. It was a closed adoption. If any of you are familiar with adoption, um, if it's closed, you can't reach out to each other, like you can't have any contact. And so I had no clue of who my parents were. I would like make up things in my mind, like who they were, because I knew my father was Nigerian. My mother, adopted mother did know that much, but I didn't know like what they looked like or anything. So I would make things up in my mind with who I thought they were. But I knew that I needed to find them in order to just continue to grow in my faith and continue to heal. And so um, I submitted, because I was a nurse, I knew I could do certain things. So I was like, okay, let me, <laughs> I, was like, I was like, let me submit um, some papers to the hospital I knew I was born at so they can send me my records. So they did send me my records and it was crazy. Like it was a thick packet, like that thick. And it had all this information on my birth. That's how I found out that I was born at one of Bethany, Florida. Because it was like, um, at the time, my last name was Richardson. That was my biological mom's last name. It was like, baby girl Richardson was born at this time. Um, my APGAR, I don't know, anybody's in here know about APGAR, but my APGAR score was very low. It was so sad. Like, I was... Yeah, because she didn't she didn't take any prenatal, so she just had me, had me. My placenta was in the toilet. Um, I was blue, like, and they rushed me to the hospital, and then I was fine. I was in the NICU for a little bit, and I was fine. But all the information about like my mother and father was blacked out because I was, they knew I was going to be adopted, so they couldn't release any identifying information about them. I was like, man, <laughs> my, my trick, my trick failed because <laughs> I thought I was going to find information about my parents in there. Found the information about myself, not my parents. So I was like, okay, let me go to the agency in which I was um, born. And so I submitted papers. Uh, it was crazy. It was, it was a crazy process. But one thing led to another, and this lady, Betsy White, she reached out to me and she said, um, hey, Kylie, I... She said, this is so crazy, y'all. She was like, um, I actually know who you are. This lady, guys, this was in 2015. This lady did my adoption in 91. Wow. She still worked there. So she was wow. like, um, this is just, it's just a God thing. And she was like, I actually know you. <laughs> she was like, I did your adoption when you were in, and back in 91. And she said, submit this paper, fill this out, and um, I will try to connect you because um, the good and bad news, the good news is your father has been looking for you since you were 18, but the bad news is we haven't had contact with him for the last year. Like he, The way he, he used to submit papers like every January to reach out to me. So she's like, we haven't talked to him, and it's like in you know, October at this point. So she said, we haven't talked to him since January. Um, she's like, we don't, we don't know where your mother is. So she's like, fill this out. And so I filled the papers out, um, and she sent me back his... Um, his email and his phone number. And so I was like, I'm not going to call him. I was just so scared. I was like, I'm not going to call him. So I'm going to email him. And so um, I saw him this long email and I still have it. I read it like every year. Just, it's, it's, I don't know, it's just a nice memory for me. Um, but I sent him this long email just telling him about, you know, faith and nursing and like, I'm not mad at them anymore and like just wanting to hear a story. And then also told him, I was like, and don't be mad because I'm cute. So. <laughs> You made a cute daughter, so it's just like it's okay. And so, um, and so the next day he emailed me, and he was like, "Oh, he thought it was spam." And if and I have one day I'm gonna get my father to church. Please pray for my father, Olu. But some of you guys know him, and if you know him, like actually, I'm actually just like this crazy. Um, but he was like, "I thought it was spam." He's like, um, and then he knew it was me when I told him I was cute. <laughs> Because he's like, yeah, only my daughter would say something like that. <laughs> and so we were emailing back and forth for like a day. And we were both like, wow, this is 2015. Why are we emailing? Like, let's just get on the phone. And so we got on the phone and we talked for hours. And at that time, we were entering into the Thanksgiving season. And so he was like, well, I'll just come to Pittsburgh and hang out with y'all. I was like, all right. <laughs> and so I, was so I was still working as a nurse at this time. And I, I couldn't, like, I was working and I couldn't even function that whole day. Like, I was 
passing my meds and like my mind was all over the place. My best friend took me to the airport and yeah, he just came out and we just hugged each other and it was like nothing happened. It was the craziest thing. And I was like, all right, like you're my dad. He was like, you know, like I'm your daughter. We looked alike. We had a great time. And then um, just beautiful things like in the midst of this to the point where he lived in Dallas at the time. He worked for um, Texas Instruments and the same, I was about to be a travel nurse at that time, and my job was on the same street as his job. It was wow. crazy, like crazy God stuff like that. Like, so I got to spend three months with him, uninterrupted, like not even knowing at the time. So I moved to Dallas, got to hang with him, and then in the midst of all of that, Betsy reached out. To, I gotta call Betsy now. I think my like, <laughs> haven't talked to her in like a year or so. Um, but Betsy um, called me. She's like, "Hey, your mother reached like she reached out to us looking for you." And so I was like, "Okay." So um, I submitted the papers for her and um, began to start the process to find her. And um, it was a little my relationship with her is a little more different because. In the midst of all that, if you're, I don't know if anybody is adopted or tried to find anybody, but it makes you become like the craziest private investigator ever. <laughs> like, I feel like I can find out anything about anybody. Um, and so when I was looking for her, I ended up finding this news article um, that had a court date in it. And long story short, she had, she had another kid after me. So I have a baby brother, but she gave him up for adoption as well. And so her and I's relationship was strained because when I had like asked her, like, yeah, so I know you have my older sister, but did you have any more kids? She said no. So she essentially like lied. And so like right there was like kind of a, an area of just like distrust. And so over the years, and then she was upset that I knew that and no, like she didn't tell anybody else about that baby. And so one thing, and I pray, like, <laughs> I'm like, mom, me and her do not get along, but I pray one when I, you know, get married and have kids, I carry babies like her because she carried all of us and nobody knew. Like she said, she like carried very small, like she just looked like she just ate a little too much. And she had the kids quick. Like she said, all of her kids were spontaneous, like quick, she had us, and then I was it. And so I'm like, even though it sucks that she did that, like praise God, I pray for that. I pray, I pray for that type of pregnancy. <laughs> Um, so anyway, yeah, she had she had my baby brother, and um, nobody knew but me at the time, and um, it just created a strain. And she's also she doesn't she's a Hebrew Israel Israelite, and so she doesn't like my faith and just me being a Christian and different things like that. So we we don't get along. Sadly, we haven't talked in probably like two years now because it, it's just a lot of um, um, just a lot of friction. A lot of friction, and so um, you could be praying for her. her name is Nomita, and I was like, "Girl, how do you think I was going to find you? Your name is Nomita. <laughs> like, like, I'm going to find you." Um, and so, uh, yeah, just be praying for her. But anyway, um, through all of that, obviously, like you know, still taking care of a, a handicapped mother, and um, and my, my mother, who I call my mother Gwen, who's my adopted mother, she's she's stable now, um, but still has issues. She's 73 years old. Um, so ailments are um, always going to be a part of her, considering everything she went through. And so I've wrestled with that, being a caregiver, and then also being adopted, and then also having to take care of myself, and also having to go through the emotions of finding my parents, and then having to build a relationship with my older sister and my younger brother, and um, just all of that. And I felt like an underlying theme of my life um, has been this this sense of like suffering and abandonment and lack of intimacy because I have been on my own for so long. And obviously some of that, like I said, was due to my story. And then I think some of it was for my own protection. Like I just want to, I, I function better sadly, like by myself sometimes because I have been by myself for so long. And so like where people's like, hey, you wanna go hang out, do this, and I'm like, no, I'm just gonna chill. Or we were laughing at the table. I was like, okay, y'all can do this icebreaker. I was like, y'all wanna go? <laughs> like go walk around somewhere. Cause like sometimes it just feels better for me to like just be in my own little cocoon. And again, I think that some of that is from just me functioning around even me moving to Chicago, like I didn't tell anybody. <laughs> like I thought I'm new and I was it. I just just pack my car and I left because I'm so used to not making decisions, having to be accounting to any, accountable to anybody because I have been by myself for so long. So 
I wanted to start with my story to just set the stage for a young lady in the Bible named Hannah. Um, and we read her story in 1 Samuel. Um, and I wanted to talk about her story as well because I believe that um, we sit in a similar seat, right? This mix of dealing with sorrow, yet desiring something, crying out to God, and wrestling, God, wrestling with God all in one. And so um, I think Hannah herself had to do with, like I said, a good mix of sorrow yet trust. And we'll begin reading her story in 1 Samuel as she prays to the Lord for a son. Um, if you're familiar with the story, um, Hannah had a husband who had another wife, Penina. Um, Penina had children, yet Hannah did not. And not only did her husband's wife, Penina, have something that Hannah desired, um, the wife actually taunted Hannah with it. And so let's read 1 Samuel, starting with verse 6. Um, it says, Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. I know when I was looking for my parents, I'm like, man, what year is it going to be for me to find my parents? What year is it going to be for me to get out of this suffering? What year is it going to be for God to send me my own personal family? And so um, this one went year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her until she wept and would not eat. Verse 10 says, In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. I love these emotions. Just pay attention to the emotions of Hannah. Um, she but went to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. I love how Hannah was so honest with her, and that's why I want us this morning to just be honest. If you're upset and you're feeling some type of way about something that you are bringing to the Lord, like, that is okay. Um, bring it to God because he knows. Um, verse 12, as she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your mind. She was crying out so much to the Lord, you guys, that this man thought she was intoxicated. Verse 15 says, Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. So many words in the scripture were used to describe Hannah's misery. We see some words like anguish, misery. She was deeply troubled, dealing with grief. She was weeping bitterly. Hannah was not well, you guys. And as I said, that this went on year after year. And I want you guys to ponder in your own situations. And are any of you dealing with something that you need to bring into the life that you're believing the Lord for year after year? Are you going or experiencing any type of taunting on this? And just being honest, I mean, even in, in this year, like, I felt like, you know, God, like, are you, it almost feels like, are you, like, taunting me? And I think we have to be honest about those feelings. We need to bring those into the light. Verse 17 says, Eli answered, go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. So as Hannah continued to pray, pray, you guys, what do we see here? It was a shift, right? Her situation had not changed, but her attitude and emotions did. We know, right? Talking to God, right? Makes it all right. So I come from, as you just heard, from a life of suffering and in ways, a lot of ways, um, neglect. And year after year, I pray for God to move on things that I deeply care about. Um, but I think now, more than ever, in the midst of my sorrow and in the midst of you guys' sorrow, I believe that God is calling us to bring our honesty to him because he wants to hear from us. At least for me, I've recently had a revelation that, um, you know, God is doing these major works on us because 
it is impossible. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so, um, as a believer, in order for us to continue to walk this walk, we have to increase our faith. We have to rely on God like never before. So, could it be that God wants you guys to grow in intimacy and faith in this season? That might be the turning point for you. Let's take a look at how um, her situation finally turned around. Um, in verse 19, it says, Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and he went back to their home in Rama. Elkina made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So, amen. Yes, the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. The thing she was praying for, you guys, um, year after year, Hannah was able to give birth to a son. And she named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. So Hannah conceived, you guys, and her prayers were finally answered, not in her time, but as the Lord saw fit. And throughout the story, did the Lord forget her? No, right? I don't believe that. Did the Lord intend to have her be taunted year after year by her husband's wife? No, I don't believe that either. It simply was not her time. She, however, in her anguish, brought her deepest desires to the Lord. She prayed and he remembered. She was consistent and obedient in prayer. And she trusted that God could fulfill her deepest desire. Her sorrow turned into this unrelenting faith. I just want to encourage you ladies, uh, we serve the El Roy, where God sees, right? And we must keep that in mind, as he is a God who not only sees, but he is the God that remembers us, you guys. And I'm not suggesting that everything that we cry out for, God just want to give it to him, give it to us. I believe if it's in his will, um, what we desire will happen. Um, but I want us to know that our suffering and our sorrow and our pain as a purpose, you all, and that God is using it to bring us closer to him by stre stretching our faith. As hard as it is, and as hard as I, I think about my life and the different things I went through, um, I thank God for where I am first and foremost. Um, and I also think that it's just our, it was my duty and your duty as well to press regardless because we don't know where our prayers will take us. And so doing some research, um, the top three reasons that Christians doubt um, is because of human suffering. And so um, we need to decide today, right, if we're going to trust God or not with the things that we have gone through. Trust God with our story because suffering and sorrow will show up at some point. Like, it's inevitable. We will have uh, pain. We will go through different things. And if I'm honest, like, even in this season, I've been challenged in some areas. But I feel like God has pressed me and said, you know what, Kylie? First off, you've been through a lot before, and I've brought you this far, so you know what I'm capable of. Um, so, yeah, look, that's a, a nugget also for you guys. Um, continue to go back on things that he came through. On, if he can, if he, the way I look at it is like, okay, Kylie. You literally found your parents <laughs> like that. It was such an impossible task. Like, what can God do? You yeah. found your baby brother. And you found like your sister. And you were able to still serve your mother well, even at a young age. Like, if God can do all of these things, He can do it. So, also take a look at you guys' stories and see if He's done different things in your life in the past. Use that for what is to come. But um, as we go through our sufferings, um, just remember to get praise. <coughs> And one way that we can express and pray and praise God, um, at least one way I like to do it, is through journaling. And so um, I love the Bible. It's so cool because he gives us these 150 journal entries or songs as we um, have, and we are going to explore that. And so um, on the screen I have for you, if you guys didn't know that the songs in scripture are like there's different songs and so um, I have some here there's songs of praise which are celebratory in nature expressing expressing adoration and worship to the divine um, there's songs of thanksgiving that are expressions of gratitude recounting the blessings and acts of kindness bestowed by the divine there's royal songs that focus on the themes of king, kingship often celebrating the reign of God as the ultimate sovereign. There are songs of wisdom that impart practical insights and moral teachings, offering guidance on living a righteous and fulfilling life. 
this is a song that I wrote and um, that we're going to get a chance today actually to write a song, the Songs of Lament. They're heartfelt expressions of sorrow, grief, or distress. Um, there's imprecatory songs which express a desire for God's justice and intervention, often invoking curses upon the enemies of the psalmist. And then I can never say this word, but these type of songs <laughs> are expressions of Okay, penitential. Our expressions of remorse, seeking God's forgiveness and mercy. They acknowledge human frailty and the need for divine grace. And so if I can write a song about my, I'm 33 now, so just like the last 33 years of my life, I would probably write a song of lament, but that has a little touch of hope. And so I'm going to give you my example of a song. Okay. So. <laughs> All right, so it will start with, um, knowing. God, I've known you since I was five, and it has been the sweetest discovery I've ever known. Even more beautiful of me knowing you at five is the idea that you knew me no more than five seconds of me being conceived. Honest, since you have known me, you can, you, sorry, how can you have me in some situations that I have been in? I wrestle because I'm extremely blessed and I feel your favor over my life. But I, like Hannah, have been dealing with issues year after year, and I'm desperate for your intervention. When will you step in? Reliance. You have been the constant in my life amidst the chaos, and I'm sometimes surprised that I'm still clothed and in my right mind. What love I feel you lavish on me, even in the sorrow of my heart. I only have you. And then trusting, you you are who you said you are, and will do as you promised. And even if you don't, God, you are still good. Yeah. With all my might, I'll fight daily to do what pleases you, and that is to trust. I feel it to be my tangible task due to you. In my sorrow, worthy is your name. And so I don't know what sorrow you guys have um, entered this event with, and I'm praying that you sit in a position, however, of bringing all honesty into the light, right? Bring all your pain, bring your doubts, bring your fears, bring your sorrow, bring your agony, your sin, your gluttony, your mental health, your jealousy, your hopelessness, your fornication, your self-harm, all of it. He knows and he cares for you. I encourage you all to continue to write and journal and tell your story, cry out, trust in him to handle what you bring. And so for the next 15 minutes, I want us to take time to write our own song. And you can actually go back to the slide, um, um, Autumn, where it has the different types of songs, um, because I want you guys to take some time to think about um, what season you're in, which you need to bring to the light, and a type of song that, yeah, you, you think that is um, representative of what you're going through. Hey, if you're not in a season of lament, it's okay, right? It's not uh, Thanksgiving or praise, but I want us to just to take some time to do so. And then I would like maybe one or two lucky uh, brave souls to share their song if you would like to at the end of it. But um, yes, we're going to take some time to do that and then we will come back. 